In this video, we'll be discussing carbohydrates, and this is from B1.1 on carbohydrates and lipids. This is all part of the core or standard level material. As we begin our discussions on biological molecules, we're going to notice that these are all carbon-based molecules. And carbon is a great molecule for all of these biological molecules because it's really good at forming four stable covalent bonds. Now, when we say covalent bond, what we mean is a bond created by the sharing of electrons between two atoms, okay? So carbon can form four of those those um, covalent bonds and they are extremely stable. Carbon can form bonds with itself or with a variety of other elements and that makes it really versatile for creating stable and complex uh, structures and molecules. And here we have a few examples that you'll be getting quite familiar with. Um, this is a saturated fatty acid, and you don't have to know that just yet. Um, but it's important to note here that this carbon-based molecule is in like a chain-like structure. We're going to see that pop up several times, as well as carbon rings. So we'll be looking at rings in terms of different monosaccharides or sugars um, and different types of lipids. Both of these are based on carbon. So let's take a look at how we get some of these complex structures. We're going to be producing things called macromolecules. So this prefix macro means big. So I'm going to create big macromolecules by taking smaller units called monomers and linking them together to form a polymer. So monomers would be like these small individual units. And when you form a bond between them, what you're going to get is a much larger molecule and that's called a polymer. Now, the way that that happens is through something called a condensation reaction. And condensation reactions are going to involve the removal of water. And when you do that, it forms a bond between those two molecules. And we can see that right here. So again, we're going to remove a water molecule, which is H2O. Where is that coming from? Well, H2, two hydrogens, and one oxygen. That's where I'm getting that water molecule. And that's going to leave this oxygen left over to be shared by this carbon and this carbon right over here. And so we get a bond here. Now, if it is a bond between two monosaccharides, more on those later, but two simple sugars, we call that a glycosidic bond. So again, this prefix glyco meaning sugar, this is just a special type of bond that I get when I perform a condensation reaction between these two sugars, leaving them bonded together. Now, mono means one, so monosaccharide is a simple sugar. A disaccharide, di means two, a disaccharide is two monosaccharides bonded together. So a great example here is maltose. Maltose is made of two glucose molecules bonded together. Poly means many, saccharide meaning sugar, so this is many sugar molecules, many monosaccharides linked together. And a great example here is a molecule called amylopectin. It's one of the forms of starch. And amylopectin just so happens to be made of monomers of glucose. Glucose is a six carbon sugar, and those carbons can actually be numbered. There's actually an oxygen in this structure right here. So to number the carbons, we number them this way. One, two, three, four, five, and the six carbon is actually up here. We generally don't draw that in the ring structure. Now, I can form a bond between the first and the fourth carbon of adjacent glucose molecules, and that's going to give me something called a 1-4 linkage, one referring to the number one carbon here and four referring to the number four carbon on the other glucose molecule. And when I do that, that's going to result in these very like linear portions of a molecule. 
If I have a bond between the first and the sixth carbon of adjacent glucose molecules, so something like this, and don't forget this is actually attached to this carbon over here, that's going to give me a one six linkage, again, between the first carbon of one and the sixth carbon of a different molecule, and that results in branching. So when we see branches in a molecule, especially something like amylopectin, we should be thinking about these one six linkages. Now, regardless of which linkage you're forming, they're all formed by these condensation reactions just between different carbons. And we're going to be making different macromolecules with different versions, sometimes called isomers, of glucose. And we'll see two here um, that are going to be important to us. One is called alpha glucose, and the other is called beta glucose. Now, what you'll notice about these two is they look very similar, but in alpha glucose, we have this arrangement of the hydroxyl group and the hydrogen connected to that number one carbon. And in beta glucose, we're going to have a different arrangement here. So again, on the first carbon, this hydrogen and this hydroxyl group are switched. So it's important to remember that these molecules are three-dimensional, and so it's a bit difficult to represent that here in two dimensions, but the actual arrangement or um, of these different groups here is very important and gives these glucose molecules some slightly different properties. Now, when we were talking about how to put molecules together, we were mentioning condensation reactions. Well, the opposite can also be done. So again, condensation reactions, removing water to form a bond. If I do the opposite, so if I go the other way around and I add in water, that's going to help split apart a molecule, and that's something called hydrolysis. So this word hydro meaning water, lysis meaning to break, I'm literally adding in water to break apart two molecules. And that's a very interesting and very important part of what we call digestion. Now digestion doesn't just happen in your body, it's something that happens to molecules. It's the chemical breakdown of larger molecules into smaller molecules. So not necessarily chewing your food, but the chemical breakdown, meaning I'm taking apart these larger molecules to make smaller pieces, and that will always involve hydrolysis reactions. So we talked about disaccharides, which is two monosaccharides hooked together, and polysaccharides, which is many monosaccharides put together. But what is a monosaccharide? Well, this prefix mono, again, means one, and this means just one simple sugar. And there are a few simple sugars that you should know. So some of them are what we call triose sugars, tri meaning three, those are three carbon sugars pentose sugars, so penta meaning five, these are five carbon sugars. That's gonna be something like ribose or deoxyribose. And then we have hexose sugars, and hex means six, so these are six carbon sugars. Five carbon sugars and six carbon sugars are going to be in a ring form, and they're going to also include an oxygen atom. So we looked at alpha and beta glucose just a little while ago. There are one, two, three, four, five, six carbons, but not all six form the ring structure. Five of them are in the ring structure, and incorporated into that ring is the oxygen atom. There are lots of important sugars that you should know about or monosaccharides that you should know about, but if I had to pick one that was the most important, I would definitely say glucose. We'll be talking about this one in a lot of different topics. So glucose, C6, H12O6, you should know that. Um, it is a polar molecule, and so therefore it's going to be soluble in water, which means it can be transported in our blood plasma and can do a whole lot of other things. It's relatively small, um, and it's a very stable compound, even when it's dissolved in water. And what we're gonna talk a lot about in future topics is that it yields a lot of energy when it is oxidized. So when this is kind of taken apart bit by bit, a lot of energy can be released from that molecule with big implications for things like cell respiration. 
There are lots of polysaccharides, many monosaccharides bonded together, um, with very important properties for living things. We're going to be focusing on just a small number of them, okay? And so we'll talk about the similarities and differences here. Now, all of these polysaccharides are not soluble, and so that has big implications for things like transport and osmolarity, if you've already studied that. And they have no fixed size, which means that we can add a lot of monosaccharides together to make a huge molecule, or it can be a little bit smaller. They're not exactly a fixed size or a fixed number of glucose molecules. They do have slightly different functions. So we have a polysaccharide called cellulose, and that is going to be for structural support. So mainly in those like plant cell walls is how we'll be talking about cellulose. And then in terms of energy storage, glycogen is the energy storage molecule in animals, and starch is the energy storage molecule in plants. Now what we'll notice is that starch has two different forms. One called amylose, that's got those 1,4 linkages, and one called amylopectin, that's got those 1,4 and 1,6 linkages, um, but both of them function as an energy storage molecule. So we'll kind of break that down here, right? Okay, so energy storage molecule in plants, they are both made out of uh, monomers of alpha glucose, so both amylose and amylopectin. Again, what we're going to notice is a different shape due to those different linkages. So amylose, only the 1,4 glycosidic bond, so that's going to be linear. And we say linear, it's actually really going to form kind of like this linear spiral shape, but it's still linear, it's still in a line. And this amylopectin is going to have one four linkages, so it's going to form this spiral shape. But in addition to that, it's also going to have one six linkages, so we're going to get these branches. And that will look a little something like this, uh, maybe a bit better than my drawings. Um, you should be able to recognize amylose and amylopectin. You should be able to remember that they are both forms of starch. And it's a good idea to have um, a firm grasp on how those different bonds result in those different structures. Theme B is all about form and function. And so that will become a very important concept throughout this topic. Glycogen is a very similar molecule to amylose, or really amylopectin. It's a very similar molecule, structurally speaking. It's made out of alpha glucose, and it's got both 1,4 and 1,6 linkages, but it's just got a lot of 1,6 linkages, so much more than we would find in amylopectin, and that's going to result in a highly branched molecule. But again, a very similar um, structure and function. This is an energy storage molecule, but not in plant plants like starch, but rather animals. And now let's go back and talk about that structural polysaccharide called cellulose. So cellulose, again, doesn't have a function in energy storage. And that's kind of tough to remember because it is made of glucose. And a lot of people associate glucose with energy. But glucose in its beta glucose form and in these 1,4 glycosidic bonds doesn't form a molecule that humans can use for energy. Rather, it's a structural component of the plant cell wall. So cellulose isn't for energy, it's a structural component, um, and it forms these very straight chains. Again, we should be thinking straight or linear when we see 1,4 glycosidic bonds. So this is one molecule of cellulose. So again, you can see that they form very straight chains. Because of the arrangement of these hydroxyl groups in that glucose molecule, it can actually form hydrogen bonds with adjacent chains. So remember, glucose is a polar molecule, and polar molecules are going to have partial charges, and when um, those opposite partial charges are near each other, they can form a hydrogen bond. And so we'll have lots of hydrogen bonds that link several of these linear chains together, and that makes cellulose very strong. Wrong. Okay, so again, when we think about form and function, we really need this to be strong if it's going to be a structural component of those plant cell walls. 
And the last carbohydrate that we'll talk about in this video is something called a glycoprotein. Now, this word glyco refers to sugar, so lucky for us, it is exactly what it sounds like. It is a protein with a sugar or carbohydrate molecule attached to it. And we're going to see that right here, okay? So this is my glycoprotein. And again, it's made up of two components. So we've got the protein part down here, and then this carbohydrate chain, so maybe I'll highlight that in blue here, um, right up in this region. And this is always going to face outwards. So this in here would be like the inside of the cell, this would be the outside of the cell, and that's very important because this this carbohydrate chain is used for recognition. Each cell is going to have a unique pattern of monosaccharides sticking out here. And so we can think of that as being kind of like cellular name tags, a way for cells to recognize um, each other or maybe recognize things that don't belong there. Um, and that is a very important function of these glycoproteins. And we're going to see that play out in a very important example here um, of blood type. So there are four blood types in humans. We have type A, type B, type AB, and O. And these different blood types um, can be recognized by these different antigens that are on the outside. So this is a new word for some of you. Antigen is a recognition feature on the outside of a cell or a virus. Um, and in this case, it is going to be one of those glycoproteins. Um, and there are four, sorry, three different types of antigens, A, B, and O. Of course, type AB is a blood type that has both type A and type B antigens, but these are particular to each person. So for example, I have type B blood, and so that might means that my immune system recognizes these type B antigens, these type B glycoproteins. If I got a blood transfusion that had type A blood in it, my immune response would try to attack those blood cells, okay? So it can cause rejection with the wrong blood type. And that is all due to these glycoproteins. So lots of different forms and functions of carbohydrates.